Okay. All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. Welcome to today's webinar presented by SAMHSA's Game Center with the support of SAMHSA, which is the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. Today's webinar is titled Responding to a Growing Demographic Supporting Older Adult Populations Within the Criminal Justice System. And today's presenter is Dr. Stephanie Grace Post, and I will introduce her shortly. But first, I have a couple of introductory items to review with you. Um, I'm Dr. Melissa Stein. I go by the pronouns she, her, and I'm a senior resource associate at SAMHSA's Gain Center and policy research associates. And you'll see a chat box um, uh, icon at the bottom of your screen. Feel free to use the chat box to introduce yourself and share where you're joining us from. I am joining the call from Charlotte, North Carolina. And uh, the views, opinions, and content expressed in this presentation and discussion do not necessarily reflect the views, opinions, or policies of the Center for Mental Health Services, the Center for Substance Abuse Treatment, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, or the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. And we do have um, a Q&A pod for uh, any of you who have questions in for the presenter or in regards to the technology please click and type your questions into the Q&A pod at the bottom of your screen, and we will get to as many questions as time permits following the end of the presentation. We'll also be conducting a couple of polls throughout this event. When you see a poll pop up on your screen, please select and submit your response. And you should have just seen a poll pop up. The webinar is being recorded and the slides for our presentation will be shared with all registrants for this event. We will also notify you when the recording of this webinar is posted to SAMHSA's YouTube channel. And a certificate of attendance will be available for download at the end of today's presentation. Um, please note that this certificate is for your personal portfolio only. We are not able to issue CEU credits. There is ASL interpretation for today's event. Our interpreters today are David Gratzner and Kip Oberman. We also have live captioning for today's event. To view live captioning, click Live Transcript CC, then select Show Subtitles. And I, I apologize, I uh, misrepresented our interpreters today. They are David Gratzner and Megan Thorpe. Just a quick look at our agenda. Uh, here at the Gain Center, more and more conversations are bubbling up about serving older adults, whether we're talking about calls to 988 or people reentering the community after incarceration. The issues that older adults face and the services they need often vary from the general population. This webinar is one step towards increasing knowledge and awareness about this critical issue as well as exploring potential strategies and solutions that you might consider incorporating in your own agencies or programs at the state or local level. We'll be moving on to our presentation shortly, but first I'd like to briefly introduce our speaker. Dr. Stephanie Grace Post is an associate professor at Raymond A. Kent School of Social Work and Family Science at the University of Louisville. She has served as a principal investigator or a co-PI on several recent projects looking at older adults in carceral settings or the reentry process. She's currently developing a tailored intervention to improve chronic disease self-management and life quality among older adults who have returned to their community from incarceration. Her work has been funded by the Aging Research and Criminal Justice and Health Network via the National Institute on Aging, and the National Institutes of Health Justice Community Opioid Intervention Network, learning experiences to advance practice investigator track. So you've learned about who will be speaking to you today, but we'd also like to learn more about uh, who all is joining us for today's presentation. And it looks like most of you, 55% of you are joining from urban locations, followed by about 26% of you joining from rural locations. 
We also have a few of you joining from reservation pueblos or Alaska Native villages. And in terms of your agency or organization, it looks like a majority of you are joining from community-based provider organizations, but that is very closely followed by 28% uh, 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 of you representing corrections, probation, or parole. We also see many of you joining from government or policy positions. I'm also seeing some um, academia, the judiciary, and public health. So welcome, thank you so much for your time today and uh, for spending your afternoon with us. Without further ado, ado, I'm gonna turn things over to Dr. Post to begin her presentation. Dr. Post. Thank you so very much. Uh, I, in the 400 text messages or whatever that showed up in the chat, I saw at least two. I wanna offer a shout out to Cayuga, work uh, going on there in Ohio. And then also to Broward County reps. Um, so that's my old stomping grounds. I appreciate so very much and am humbled by uh, the wide variety of folks who have joined us today. Um, so as um, we've already learned, my background is principally in uh, research surrounding older adulthood, but I did wanna offer a couple of disclosures, some pragmatic and some otherwise. Um, I'm here in uh, my office at the University of Louisville in Louisville, Kentucky, and we are about five seconds from a principal UPS hub. I say that uh, just to acknowledge that there might be some pretty loud noises in terms of the planes flying overhead. Um, I also want to offer that it, despite this being or perhaps in spite or directed by uh, my personal experiences related to the criminal legal system, um, I've been working in prison since about 2015. Um, but I am the adult child, the sister, and the aunt of folks who are currently under supervision uh, throughout the country. So I just kind of want to make mention of that in terms of my views and perspectives. Likewise, a uh, final acknowledgement, which is I will be presenting some findings today uh, from my work alongside the Kentucky Department of Corrections. And so none of that work is uh, approved or endorsed by the department. That's an important disclosure that we offer um, despite their having uh, supported us in asking and answering some important questions. Just wanna make sure that caveat is out there. Okay. So uh, my learning objectives are threefold to kind of paint uh, the larger portrait of this shifting demography in our criminal legal system or criminal justice system, highlight some of these multifaceted and interrelated challenges of older adults throughout the criminal justice system with a focus on uh, the correctional environment, principally in jails and prisons. And then finally, thinking through um, some of our, our challenges that we have faced uh, in terms of existing supports and then areas we could also use some innovation and opportunity. Those strategies, or excuse me, those objectives set forth for the today's webinar relate to understanding the unique medical and social challenges faced by the population and related strategies to meet those needs. And then finally, uh, spending a little bit of time on specific considerations related to re-entry, that post-incarceration period, which I know based on the poll is probably where a lot of you are working. All right, so let's go ahead and get started with um, some of these visual aids here. So uh, the etiology of older adults, large and growing pop uh, population within the criminal legal system is shaped by no fewer than three primary causes. The first of which is the overall aging of the US population. Second of which includes increased arrests among older adults. And then third, the longstanding impact of the wars on crime, drugs, and the Crime Control Act of 94. So I wanna start here uh, with an image from the US Census uh, that briefly outlines that by 2034, older adults aged 65 and older will outnumber those aged 18 and under and nearly one in four will be 65 by 2060. Supplemented with this visual from the Urban Institute, the proportion of persons aged 85 and older is anticipated to reach 15% by 2040, doubling from 2020. So each of these images reflect the same story, which is that our nation is aging. Um, trends in the community broadly are understood to shape trends behind bars and within community corrections. And so at this point, we understand there are likely more older persons supervised by the state in all uh, settings of the criminal legal system 
than there has been historically. In addition to the overarching shift in the U.S. general population, we have also seen an increase in arrests among older adults. Now, to be clear, older adults are far more likely to be the victims of crime than to commit crime themselves. However, uh, we do also know that individuals over the age of 50 do in fact commit uh, criminal behaviors and are arrested. There is a long-standing finding in criminological scholarship surrounding the age crime curve. Many of you probably heard this in your undergraduate courses, uh, that as we age, uh, our likelihood of engaging in criminal behavior decreases. And so that's, that's long, a long-standing finding in our field. This can be due to two primary uh, or perhaps uh, interdependent um, reasons. The first is which decreased strength and energy that is necessary to commit or engage in criminal behavior. Those are called criminal energetics. A second uh, potential uh, framework is understanding that as we age, our testosterone and aggression decrease and thereby our self-control increases. However, again, older adults do in fact commit crime and some are arrested. This chart from Prison Policy Initiative showcases an increased proportion of older adults arrested in 2021 compared to 1991. And using a national longitudinal data set from 2022 to 2017, so capturing 15 years, um, scholars relate the overall pre uh, prevalence of older adults engaging in criminal behavior is about 1.2%. And so uh, based on these findings, we know that the likelihood of folks engaging in criminal behavior over the age of 50 is somewhat limited. However, arrests may relate to both violent and nonviolent offenses. For those who have been previously incarcerated, technical violations are also a concern. A recent study found that a spike in criminal behavior occurred in persons aged 65 or older in the year 2007. Uh, likely linked to the market instability of the 2006 financial crisis due to subprime housing loans and subsequent impacts on retirement. So in our findings, uh, in terms of what people are arrested and incarcerated for, there's a wide variety of charges. Um, scholarship out of Sweden has indicated that older adults aged 60 and older were often imprisoned for murder and sex offenses. Uh, in a statistically significantly different way than those aged 59 or younger. Um, here in the older adults in Kentucky State Prisons study, uh, self-reported uh, charges associated with the current incarceration included rape at 28%, homicide at 27%, aggravated assault at 15%, as well as nonviolent offenses and technical charges at about 14%. Uh, let me shift here. And that kind of leads us to this final visual aid in terms of uh, those three factors that uh, coalesce to uh, influence the number of persons age 50 or older in the criminal justice system. So we've talked a little bit about the shifting demography, as well as an increased uh, number of persons who are being arrested over the age of 50. But this chart um, from Pew Charitable Trusts reveals a large increase in the number of folks who are sentenced to prison between 1999 and 2016, aged 55 or older. And Carson and Sable from the Bureau of Justice Statistics relate that this likely reflects that most older adults who are incarcerated are actually arrested during early and middle adulthood. So it's not that they're committing their first offense later in adulthood, it's that they've encountered the criminal legal system earlier and aged in place. So in this sense, older adults who are incarcerated my apologies, older adults who are incarcerated or preparing for re-entry may have uh, committed their first offense in their uh, youth, aged in, in that place, or committed a, an offense later in life and having spent only a small portion of time behind bars. Um, as a reflection of this, our findings here in Kentucky relate the first of, uh, age of first incarceration average was right around 31. It's actually a little bit older in, the, in that sense. So that kind of leads us to where we are today. As a capstone to kind of this, this discussion surrounding the demography of the U.S. criminal legal system, uh, we have these three lines. Using data from the Bureau of Justice Statistics, we see kind of three trends. Broadly, we see the U.S. population aged 50 and old, 55 and older, excuse me, which is the deep blue navy dashed line all the way along the bottom of this chart. Just above that, we see the associated U.S. prison population total and its associated trend. Finally, this sort of brilliant solid red line 
um, shows us the 30 years of steady increasing numbers of older adults incarcerated in prisons, both state and federal. Um, and as you can see, there's quite a disparity in terms of the representation of older persons in the population and their subsequent uh, accounting for uh, in the actual prison population. So this kind of shows some credence for that it's not just uh, the shifting of the demography overall in the general population, but a culmination of factors uh, driven by longstanding punitive practices and the aging in place. Before we go too far, it's worth uh, discussing some controversy surrounding the work of older adulthood in the criminal justice system, and that relates to accelerated aging. So an important element in this conversation is understanding the role of this sort of expedited aging process broadly. Uh, it reflects the experience of persons who are incarcerated in terms of being exposed to factors prior to their incarceration and post-incarceration and the ex, um, sort of expedience of an aging related process. We understand broadly this is rooted in the, the experience of stress, which contributes to both cellular senescence, so aging at the cellular level, alongside inflammatory responses. And so these two factors, both independently and in tandem, contribute to what is known as inflammaging. Uh, this inflammaging, in, in turn, gives way to expedited morbidity and therefore, therefore, therefore excuse me, mortality, leading to premature death. And so broadly, we understand the pathway of persons who are incarcerated uh, to often be pocked by pre-incarcerated experiences in terms of childhood adversity, family violence, community conflict, uh, and public health deficits that coupled with experiences during their incarceration, such as violence, limited access to exercise, vitamin mineral rich foods, or meaningful leisure opportunities can contribute to this accelerated aging phenomenon. And so it's worth noting as an example that if you're working with individuals whose chronological age is in their 40s or 50s, you're likely going to be engaging with someone whose biophysiological experiences mirror that of someone 10 to 15 years senior. So something to keep in mind. Additionally, I encourage you all to think briefly about how this finding might shape our understanding of the previous statistics shown in terms of the large and growing population of older persons in the criminal legal system. Some of you may be familiar with this visual aid. This is from the Bureau of Justice Statistics, providing a broad overview of the pathway from an initial touch point with the criminal legal system through law enforcement, all the way through kind of the far end uh, corrections, post uh, um, parole or out of system experiences. So I want to kind of keep this in mind. The vast majority of scholarship in this area focuses on that sort of yellow space, the orange and yellow space at the far right-hand side of the visual aid there. And so that is oftentimes where we draw a lot of our insight regarding the experiences of older adults. And an area of needed inquiry relates explicitly to those pre-incarceration experiences and re-entry related um, experiences of the population kind of overlaying this, and I will offer that I, I'm pretty sure there's a social worker or two in the room. Uh, this is a common framework that we use when working with clients and communities, um, and serves as sort of a cursory biopsychosocial spiritual legal framework. Um, again, it's kind of a cursory model, but helps us to think about the interrelatedness of each of these facets of one's identity. So our medical experiences influence our legal experiences, and the inverse is also true. And likewise, our medical experiences can inform our spiritual experiences and vice versa. So there's kind of this interrelated nature of these facets of our, of our identity. Um, again, all persons who enter the criminal legal system are going to encounter hurdles. So I don't wanna uh, diminish uh, the experiences of folks entering the, the system regardless of their age. Notably, uh, Black, Indigenous, and persons of color, those BIPOC communities face a disproportionate burden, um, as does uh, members of the LGBTQIA uh, population. So something to be considering um, is that at this time, we don't have a lot of evidence in terms of intersectionality among our older adults, save for some very critical work offered by Tina Mashi at Fordham surrounding the experiences of older um, LGBTQ persons in prison. So just wanted to make that point. Okay. 
As we kind of begin to discuss uh, the primary challenges facing older adults in the criminal justice system, the core focus of today's presentation will be those medical and social spheres. I will hint briefly uh, related to the uh, spiritual aspects and legal aspects of individuals as well. But I wanted to get started with the sort of medical uh, focus, which is often one of the greatest challenges that those meeting the needs of the population during their incarceration and during reentry uh, face. So we know that all persons who are incarcerated carry a heavier health burden than those in the community. Uh, but among persons who are incarcerated, those aged 50 or older face a unique constellation of health-related issues, uh, which are often compounded by both mental illness, longstanding substance misuse, um, and limited social networks. And so I'll start with infectious disease, which are those uh, conditions that are readily communicable, things like the flu, the cold, COVID-19, rotavirus, tuberculosis, and hepatitis C. These are all disproportionately represented among persons in prison compared to the community. And the Bureau of Justice Statistics relates that about 17% of folks who are incarcerated in state prisons and 10% of those incarcerated in federal prisons have reported an infectious disease during their incarceration. This is due to a variety of factors, no doubt, and many of these are shared with other congregate settings, places like nursing homes and cruise ships. But in terms of chronic disease, this is where we really see kind of the burdens of older adults manifest. So related to chronic disease, which are those conditions that require ongoing support, generally over a year in terms of medical intervention. We also have a measure of multimorbidity. Multimorbidity is simply the presence of two or more chronic conditions. So I'll talk about those sort of in tandem. So this is where the bulk of scholarship uh, kind of emerges in this content area. And so a couple of meaningful findings I, I would like to share. So the first is coming out of the Texas Department of Corrections. 65% of those aged 55 years or older had at least one chronic disease. And those 55 years or older accounted for nearly 50% of all persons in the Texas prison system with three or more conditions. Uh, later, from the Health and Retirement Study, researchers report about 70% of adults aged 55 or older in jail had two or more chronic conditions. And then more recently, in 2018, 57% of persons aged 50 or older had three or more diseases. The most recent kind of comprehensive uh, look at this issue among older adults was conducted by Monday and colleagues, and this is actually uh, findings from a meta-analysis, and they kind of take time to collate findings across 28 different studies um, and report emerging pooled prevalence rates of these chronic conditions in the population. 39% uh, report hypertension. Uh, 38% cardiovascular disease, 37% arthritis, 23% musculoskeletal disease, 8% cancer, 14% diabetes, and uh, almost 15% neurological conditions. And so the scholars take the next step to also compare these pooled prevalence rates to that of younger populations in the same setting and that of their non-incarcerated community-based peers, kind of affirming that the disease prevalence uh, is markedly heavier among this population than both of these comparison groups. Independent, though, though closely related to chronic disease, older adults also endure what are called geriatric conditions. And so these aren't diagnoses in the sense that it's a particular disease, but instead it's a, a constellation of symptoms uh, with multifactorial causes. So there's a bunch of things at the root of the condition. These are most commonly uh, including functional impairment, falls, pressure ulcers, incontinence, and delirium. And we're going to talk a little bit about delirium in a minute. But I want to offer a couple of important findings, and this, I think, sits well with our earlier uh, discussion or, or, or note regarding the role of um, STAR 988 or, or POUND 988, thinking about uh, resources for folks who are incarcerated as well as their uh, reentry period. So Lisa Berry and colleagues <clears throat> reported recently that functional impairment among older adults who are incarcerated was uh, was related strongly to suicidal ideation in the population. Likewise, uh, scholars have also reported that incarceration itself, upon controlling for other factors, is a known um, uh, predictor of the development of geriatric conditions in the population. As an extension of some of this kind of broader content regarding disease diagnoses, prognoses, things of that sort, I think it's worthy of uh, discussion um, 
with these kind of ancillary, these ancillary areas, durable medical equipment, pharmacology, um, and kind of diagnostics and intervention. So there isn't a scholarship currently documenting the need for durable medical equipment among older adults who are incarcerated. Likewise, we don't have findings uh, uh, regarding the need of these supports such as quad canes, walkers, rollators, oxygen and ostomies, ostomy bags um, for reentry populations either. Um, but as an important extension of, of living with chronic illness, many of these things, if not needed immediately, will be on the long-term trajectory for older adults in our care. So one of the things I wanted to make mention of in terms of durable medical equipment is this has a really important role in the reentry period for older adults. Um, many times individuals can be discharged without access to their durable medical equipment and might need to get some. <laughs> and so that can lead to some patchwork approaches to finding those supports. But it can also dictate what uh, residential settings folks have access to in terms of whether their medical needs exceed that of the, the residential space. Things like transitional housing may not be able to uh, comfortably support individuals who have mobility issues, things like that. Relatedly, as the number of chronic conditions we have increases, so too does our use of prescription medication. And two things happen as our prescription medication use increases. One, those prescriptions can interfere with one another, and they can also come with side effects that can make our health conditions worse. And so you can have poor health leading to medication use, which cause poor health. So that's an important consideration. This can also be uh, important for reentry related uh, planning in terms of uh, some medications are known to cause confusion uh, and to uh, potentially limit orientation. So that would be an important consideration for uh, rules of supervision or, or tasks associated with supervision requirements. Finally, I want to make mention of kind of the butterfly effect of this, this population in terms of Individuals aged 50 or older, of course, bear this heavy health burden, which has a direct impact on their health and well-being uh, and their life quality. But we've also heard from individuals that this has a larger standing uh, or, or larger impact on the, the system itself in terms of the correctional environment. Um, I wanted to give one example from the Oak study, which was, I think, really um, heart-wrenching. Um, we had an individual who was talking to us as a correctional staff member who said, you know, I don't really know how to help these folks and I want very much to help them, but I don't have any training and I don't, I don't necessarily think that we're going to get training because to her credit, right, this isn't her job. She wasn't planning on going into long-term care, but she recounted a particular experience that I found really meaningful, which was she was charged with the transportation detail for the person who was about to undergo a double mastectomy. And so she was kind of relaying that she had a really difficult time um, during the transport process, knowing what to say, if anything, uh, while this older woman was preparing for this life-changing uh, life intervention. Um, and then likewise, the drive home. She just felt powerless to support uh, this woman in, in light of her correctional or, or security-related role, but also wanting to support uh, the individual in terms of offering empathy for her illness. So we know that this has explicit costs in terms of correctional health care. We know that individuals with more health problems are going to cost more, and this can be related to on-site support, but also off-site diagnostics, intervention, continued imaging. Um, it can include outpatient uh, visits for things like uh, fitting um, you know, different devices. It can also include overnight stays on the back end of larger scale intervention or surgical procedures. So just something to keep in mind. Another critical area of focus for today's presentation is on the social facets of an older adult's experience in the criminal legal system. Again, drawing principally from research uh, in correctional environments, jails and prisons, we understand that all persons who are incarcerated can face challenges with low social capital. Their networks are small. They're often drawing from limited resources among their loved ones as well. But older adults face a unique challenge, which is that their social networks are subject to attrition in ways that are uh, different from those of younger populations. And this is principally because of this, uh, this concept of homophily, social homophily. We have a tendency to hang out with people who are like ourselves. We have friends who share our values, beliefs, and norms, and often they are drawn from a similar generation. And so if birds of a feather 
fur feather flock together, that means that as you're uh, you're enduring these chronic health issues, so too are your your friends and your social network, which means that they aren't able to visit you uh, while you're on home incarceration, or perhaps they're unable to come up to the prison during those visitation hours because of their own health related burdens. And so we have this sort of dwindling social network available to older adults, both during their correctional stay and then post reentry. And so I'll offer a um, couple of examples here. Um, we have um, early evidence as to um, fewer visits uh, among older adults than their younger counterparts during their correctional stay in jails. And that was actually using data um, in Seminole County uh, surrounding uh, persons age 45 and over and those age 44 or younger. And then in the Oak data, we also found that 70% of adults who were incarcerated for an average of 13 years received zero visits during their incarceration. Um, importantly, that same analysis, uh, we looked at the role of visitation in, in accounting for uh, mental health, and we found that it does offer a distinct and strong uh, relationship in terms of accounting for variation in self-reported mental health in the population. So closely linked to this low social capital are workforce and, and, and sort of relatedly housing related issues. So if older adults are required to seek employment post reentry, which does happen, it can be particularly problematic in that individuals' skills are often mismatched with the needs of the community. Um, likewise, they're going to contend with age related issues in terms of if you have bias in hiring where a younger person is applying for the same position, we find historically that older adults are less likely to be selected for that role. But an important consideration, too, is that individuals may not be required to work as an element of their supervision, but they may feel the need to work just to survive, right, in terms of not having paid into the system, maybe not having social supports. Um, and so they may actually still be looking for opportunities for gainful employment so as to meet their health-related co-pays and, and things of that sort. Um, so all of these sort of in tandem kind of showcase the, the social vulnerability of the population is certainly parallel to that of other groups, but distinctly challenging. A couple of points about the mental health of older adults. An important skill in geriatric psychiatry is the ability to differentiate depression, delirium, and dementia from one another. All are disproportionately represented among older persons compared to younger persons, but delirium, which is a short order temporary condition often caused by things like infection or sleep deprivation can mirror the symptoms of dementia, which is a progressive cognitive uh, condition. And so this becomes really important for those who are providing services in correctional environments. How do we assure that those engaging with older persons, both professional staff as well as peers, understand what they're seeing in, in the older person? Can that condition or that behavior be uh, treated in such a way that that um, confusion, irritability, and loss of awareness in terms of orientation can return? So in the, the Oak study, uh, about 30% of our participants, we had 499 interviews across five institutions. About 30% of, of those who participated in the study uh, met the clinical criteria for depression um, using a standardized uh, clinical assessment. And um, what we found is that those individuals were often leaning on one another for support, but not necessarily using for formalized supports in that setting. In terms of anxiety, uh, in the Oak study, again, we found 24% of our older adults self-reported anxiety issues with nervousness, agitation, um, feelings of dread, um, and that this was intimately linked to the likelihood of uh, experiencing functional impairment. So again, talking about the interrelatedness of one's medical and mental issues alongside social, legal, and spiritual issues as well. I want to talk also briefly about post-traumatic stress. We have a tendency to talk about post-traumatic stress in the context of uh, those who are returning from combat, which is an important subpopulation of older adults in the criminal justice system. And while we are seeing fewer and fewer World War II um, vets, we are seeing an increase um, in our Desert Storm and Desert Shield veterans in these spaces. While we do still have a disproportionate representation of Korean and Vietnam War uh, folks in these spaces. So about 20% of all of the participants in the Oak study 
had been in active uh, military roles prior to their incarceration. And a third of all of the folks who participated in the study did meet the clinical criteria for post-traumatic stress. Importantly, though, that might not be rooted in a, a combat-related experience because we know that individuals who are incarcerated face disproportionate experiences of trauma, both prior to their incarceration throughout their life course, as well as during the correctional stay. We also have uh, findings regarding post-traumatic stress among older women. And uh, after having asked older women to report experiences um, prior to their incarceration, those women who reported having been held captive prior to their incarceration greatly amplified the likelihood of post-traumatic stress during their incarceration. A couple of considerations regarding the legal aspects of older adults. Um, assuring attendance at regular probation and parole office visits will be important for those who have, uh, again, supervision terms post reentry. Um, but this may become more problematic, especially with those with cognitive impairment, even mild cognitive impairment earlier stages. Things like forgetfulness and confusion are common uh, among the population. Transportation barriers become problematic. Individuals don't have licenses. And if they do, Maybe their vision is impaired or their mobility is impaired. They are unable to navigate public transportation in the ways that their younger counterparts might. Likewise, if they require durable medical equipment, things like wheelchairs, navigating public transport is complicated therein. Likewise, there's evidence uh, recently published in the Journal of the American Medical Association regarding healthcare decision making uh, for older adults who are incarcerated. And so what they uh, reported in that study was that half of all incarcerated individuals uh, were unable to make their own medical decisions. And members of, of or participants in that study, excuse me, related that uh, admission of these patients was, was generating uncertainty among the professional staff and concerns were raised regarding infringing on patients' privacy and autonomy in this space. So that is also an important consideration in terms of reentry. If individuals are hospitalized uh, during their terms of supervision, um, who is in charge of navigating probation and parole requirements if the person is uh, facing health-related challenges, how are surrogates involved in the supervision process, and things of that sort. Likewise, in terms of fiduciaries, while likely much less common probably in the correctional setting it's itself, those who do re-enter may still be uh, required to have their finances managed by another person. So not everyone coming out of a correctional setting uh, is going to necessarily have very few monetary uh, supports. But for those who do have pensions or other um, assets available to them, they can sometimes be required to use a fiduciary, which can lend itself to the risk of financial abuse among a vulnerable elder. We already know among all older people in the community that the risk of abuse is highest in terms of financial abuse. Um, and individuals who are currently under supervision may be particularly concerned about reporting um, this type of abuse or other types of abuse for fear of interfacing with law enforcement and having their terms of supervision overturned. A little nod to some of the work that we're doing um, here in the Oak study. Um, I wanted to draw your attention to two kind of theoretical frameworks, just things to keep in the back of your mind when working with older people uh, in correctional settings or back in the community. So psychosocial developmental theory relates that we navigate a bunch of conflicts throughout our life course that if navigated successfully uh, in, in endow us with certain characteristics, certain virtues. As we approach our 40s, we're really seeking generativity, which is an opportunity to give back, to generate, to be creative with the time, talent, and treasure we've been offered, and to kind of make a, a lasting impact. As we approach our late 60s, we're seeking ego integrity, which is a sense of meaning, um, kind of a story that enfolds our life course. And so we don't know a lot about the experiences of older adults in correctional settings or those navigating reentry in terms of these two conflicts. But we do know that there are older adults who have said explicitly, use us to help us. So giving of one another, sharing their wisdom, not only with other older adults in these and other spaces, but potentially intergenerational interventions, which is an area of future exploration. Likewise, uh, kind of a quick uh, nod to terror management theory. So terror management theory is kind of a, an organizing framework that helps us make sense of how do humans bear the burden of understanding our mortality? 
And the short of the long of this is that as our uh, proximity to death increases, our death anxiety can also increase if we don't have adequate coping strategies or resources or social networks on which to lean. Importantly, death anxiety is linked very closely to increased uh, morbidity as well as pain, both are which are disproportionately represented among older persons with chronic illness. Um, we've got a fourth uh, study that's forthcoming surrounding the manifestation of pain, looking at the influence of traumatic experiences in self-reported pain among the population. So we already acknowledge that there's a pathway that people who are incarcerated often have experiences of trauma prior to and during their incarceration disproportionately when compared to others, and that that can drive increased morbidity and thus the perception of pain, which can have this sort of recursive effect on death anxiety, making the approach of our, of our obvious mortality even more problematic in terms of mental health consequences and additional issues with uh, depression and anxiety. So what are we doing about it? I'm going to talk a little bit about existing strategies and then also kind of pave the way for some areas of opportunity. So as it stands, there are some uh, scaffolds in place for enhancing um, the knowledge and skills of law enforcement or police uh, surrounding older adulthood broadly and Alzheimer's disease and related dementias more narrowly. Uh, Brown and colleagues built upon an earlier needs assessment in the community and then developed, implemented, and evaluated a brief intervention to build knowledge and skills with law enforcement uh, and those with Alzheimer's disease and related dementias, and officers reported positive impacts of that training. More recently, in 2019, um, Sun and colleagues uh, completed a similar evaluation and found law enforcement officers who had a family member with dementia low levels of discomfort working with people with Alzheimer's disease and more knowledge about the disease were more likely to have positive experiences working with folks with dementia and cognitive impairment. So this becomes really important. In that particular study, we actually learned that having a family member with dementia was the strongest uh, factor in, in having these positive outcomes with folks who are in the community. So when you think about working with uh, older persons who are in the correctional setting or back in the community, keeping in mind the loved ones that you might have who are aged 65 or older, who are dealing with mild cognitive impairment or otherwise, can be helpful in terms of enhancing our empathy and our willingness to be creative in terms of interventions. A recent systematic review by Kelly, uh, Canada and colleagues reveals very few interventions are tailored for older adults within correctional settings. These five here are those that are showcased in the review published in 2020. Um, and I think most critically, uh, most of these studies had very small sample sizes. Hey, pilots are important, but I want to kind of uh, briefly talk about each. The first, uh, Art Expression, which was a six a series of six one and a half hour uh, sessions with a social work or marriage and family therapy intern. Uh, was tested with four female residents in a California prison nursing home, had positive impacts. Uh, the Be Active, uh, which was piloted right here in Kentucky, was a 10-week behavioral therapy intervention uh, supplemented with individual sessions with four male residents also in a prison nursing home. Good Vibrations took place across two prisons, which is a, a music-based intervention in England uh, with initial findings related as positive with 13 male residents. And then the two largest interventions that have been assessed to date include the Older Prisoner Health and Social Care Assessment and Plan Strategy, or OSHCAP, which was a, a randomized controlled trial with 249 controls, 200, excuse me, 249 treatment and 248 controls, so an enormous sample. And then finally, the True Grit, which is actually a structured living setting that includes recreational therapy, group and individual sessions alongside self-help groups. Um, and meaningful leisure and spiritual supports. So these interventions target a variety of health outcomes, including those geriatric conditions and mental health, things like depression, trauma, and affect, all have been conducted in prisons to date. And so thus far, no large-scale intervention uh, that is independent of a structured living space has been piloted in the U.S. I want to offer one important caveat regarding uh, structured living for older adults. 
So an important consideration for folks working in correctional settings is balancing the need to keep older persons safe in these spaces versus the potential gains by keeping those individuals within general populations as long as possible. It's closely parallel to the aging in place approaches that are used in community uh, older adult supports. And so scholars have relayed that separate spaces with associated programming and services can in fact increase health and well-being. That's what we're seeing here with True Grit. But there is evidence of positive outcomes with community uh, dwelling older adults regarding cohabitation or intergenerational opportunities for engagement. So the principal concern again here is risks in terms of victimization. So we don't have a lot of uh, reports or scholarships surrounding abuse and neglect of older adults within corrections. In fact, we just had a report published with Hastings Center documenting this very concern, which is a need to conduct research in this area. Um, but it is well documented among community dwelling older adults. So we know that older abuse, uh, elder abuse is a risk. So this is kind of a charge for future researchers and, 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 and managers and community-based supports, which is how do we make sure that folks have meaningful opportunities to engage with one another and potentially with younger groups while also keeping them safe. So strengths and limits are, are an area of inquiry that is very much so needed. Additional supports in the incarceration period include uh, chronic disease self-management approaches. This is a national effort. We've seen this kind of piloted in several institutions in both jails and prisons throughout the country. But for those who are not eligible for reentry, another important consideration is integrating the continuum of care for folks who are older. So in the community, if you were increasingly needing support, assistance with activities of daily living, things like dressing, bathing, uh, you would often move into an assisted living space. Uh, likewise, as your conditions worsen and skilled nursing is required, you would see you know, long-term care settings and then towards the end of one's life, the support of palliative or hospice care. So we're seeing kind of these pop up throughout the country, some with more evidence than others. Uh, perhaps the model uh, is that of Angola at the Louisiana State Penitentiary. But these are comprehensive interdisciplinary team models uh, nested within the correctional environment that to date have shown positive impacts for both those individuals receiving supports as well as those who are working in these environments. All right, in terms of reentry, a couple of examples of things going on here. The first and foremost I want to offer is that of Osborne's Elder Reentry Initiative. So they are by far, I would offer, the gold standard of how this ought to be done. And certainly there's always ways to improve and expand uh, the work that we're doing, the programs and services we offer, but Osborne's got it. And so the short of the long of their program is a comprehensive wraparound support in New York jails and prisons, which aid individuals prior to their release in the transitional period, and also includes follow-up supports and sort of networking among uh, a collaborative of agencies in the region. For those in, um, areas that don't have Osborne's uh, at their discretion, I wish that we all had one, um, you can also lean on local supports, principally for gerontological needs, things that would often be offered through area agencies on aging. And so there is a challenge, though, because those folks are going to have the gerontological expertise, but be limited in the, in the correctional insights of the criminal justice facets of that person's experience. Kind of on the flip side are places like Transitions Clinic Network, which is actually an enormous uh, network, multiple settings throughout the country. And like Elder uh, Reentry, the Elder Reentry Initiative, they're working to kind of aid in the comprehensive, holistic reentry planning um, that offers folks a supportive system staffed by community health workers, people who have already walked this walk, who have been previously incarcerated in making uh, their transition to the community safe and supportive and enhancing their health and well-being. Here in Kentucky, uh, we have kind of a scaffold in place. So we're hopefully going to, you know, continue to enhance our programs and services. We currently have the Healthy Reentry Coalition, which is uh, related closely to uh, perhaps the Transitions Clinic Network, but not actual formalized setting. Um, in this case, we send uh, planners into the institution to aid in enhancing the continuity of care between the correctional setting and the community by establishing follow-up appointments, getting medications ordered, uh, making sure applications for social services are filed so that there is not a gap in services upon reentry. 
In Virginia, we have uh, some evidence of a jail reentry support for those age 50 or older in Virginia. Uh, and then perhaps the most comprehensive model of skilled nursing for persons with felony convictions is 60 West. And that is a long-term care or skilled nursing facility in Connecticut um, that also provides support to those who are currently incarcerated, those who are formally incarcerated, but currently under the supervision of the state, as well as those who are formally incarcerated and no longer on paper um, who have life-limiting illness in Connecticut. So I'll offer a couple of points here in terms of where do we go? Like, so these are the things that are in place. What are the things that we still need? Um, so the previous slides, again, cover these existing strategies, but a few areas we could use some support are diverting people entirely. So reducing the touch points with the criminal legal system. And this actually brings about a unique ethical consideration. The role of silver alerts is kind of complex. We want to keep people who have cognitive impairments safe. We want to be able to find them if they're in the community and they go missing. But we also know that by its very nature, it increases the likelihood that they engage with law enforcement and without adequate training and support, it can uh, um, amount to arrest for older adults. So we want to kind of be mindful of those uh, considerations. So they need to be uh, made alert so that the person can be found, but also how do we assure that there's not um, aggression that's mist uh, mistaken for criminal behavior rather than uh, a sense of confusion. So prison policy initiative puts forth several recommendations to reduce the number of older people in corrections. Um, and th the first two kind of align explicitly with like a primary uh, public health prevention approach, which is to decriminalize homelessness and substance misuse that will keep individuals from having subsequent touch points, whether they've had an incarceration in the past or perhaps this is their first uh, interface with law enforcement. Like I've mentioned before, increasing the continuity of care is still an area that we're working. That includes not only during the incarceration, so working alongside individuals who are, are, are agencies that are providing care to folks off-site during the incarceration, but also aiding in continuity so as to reduce gaps during that transition from the correctional space into the community. In terms of specialized considerations for reentry, again, ERI is definitely the framework that we should all seek to emulate. Uh, but until those types of supports exist, I offer kind of three interrelated considerations and reentry for older adults. As social workers, we have a tendency to situate our work, our practice, our policy, and our research using an ecological systems lens. And so I would strongly encourage that approach, which is we often have a tendency to do reentry planning with that micro level system, like a, a small concentric circle at the very core of a person's identity is their family, right? So they're often working with their spouse, their adult children, and things like that to get situated. Well, in that case, because of the, the social capital issues with older adults, micro systems aren't always available. So it really requires us to think to the meso level system. Related to that, I strongly encourage the use of brokering and collaboration. And so they're somewhat distinct, though related. Don't reinvent the wheel. There are agencies that are providing supports for the population. It's simply a matter of building relationships with them and kind of increasing the likelihood that folks are being connected with appropriate supports. Things like making sure there's respite available for an, an adult child who now has an older loved one living with them who's currently on supervision. Can we get that adult child a break through a local Alzheimer's Association chapter or an adult day center? Finally, um, co-construct what you want to see in reentry alongside older adults. This is a general uh, presentation that showcases kind of findings across a variety of scholars with different settings and jurisdictions in mind. All older adults are not the same, just as the case with anyone, I suppose. And so their individualized experiences are going to be uh, highly personalized. So maybe they have a fantastic social network that we can lean on, or maybe they really don't have a lot of supports and you have to get creative and use sort of a patchwork approach where you're having the Boy Scout troop down the road build a ramp, uh, and then you're also setting up meal trains and someone who can align transportation to their oncology appointments. That's often the case here in Kentucky. So those would be some things that I would consider. Ecological systems, keep those systems in mind if you have to move outside of the, the micro area, um, and then be willing to collaborate to broker with folks who are already doing this good work. Um, and 
ask questions of your older adults. Not everyone has mild cognitive impairment, and, and we would assert to affirm the dignity of folks that even if they do have some uh, confusion or uh, issues with orientation, they still ought to be um, kind of at the center of the reentry planning experience. Kind of moving outside of that ecological systems lens from the meso to the macro, um, we also need to be instrumental in shifting public opinion because public opinion often shapes policymaker perspectives. I've worked hand in hand with graduate assistants on the Oak study and know that students came to this project very concerned about doing this work despite being in this profession. Um, and so I know how important it is to help quell anxieties, to humanize the population, while also being mindful of victim advocacy. So this would be something I would encourage you all to do. If you're not already talking about this at work, please do. I'd also encourage you to talk about it with your family, because no doubt most people don't think about prisons as long-term care settings. So it's something I think meaningful to, to add to the table. At the macro level, there's also important social networks that can be valuable for those of you who are interested in the conduct and dissemination of research, or perhaps want to partner with researchers who are doing this work. Um, I strongly encourage you all to consider joining the Aging Research and Criminal Justice Health Network. It's free. Uh, in the short of the long of it, it's a listserv. If you want to know what's going on, you can see in the, the monthly emails who's writing about what, who's doing research where. And we have regular webinars specific to the experiences of older adults throughout the criminal legal system. So it can be a valuable resource for your team. And that's it. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Post. Um, I don't know about you, but wow, my head is spinning from all of the incredible information, um, so much uh, solid research for us to really base some of these, um, some of our thoughts on. And um, yeah, thanks so much everyone for uh, showing your, your gratitude. Uh, we do have some time for some questions. So we'll wanna get into to some of those. And if you have questions that you haven't submitted yet, feel free to submit those in the Q&A pod. And, um, you know, there was a question that came up earlier and, and it uh, just really resonated with me. And I, I think that Dr. Post already started to touch on it, especially when she went over some of those, the spiritual, uh, the theories under the spiritual category. But, um, uh, you know, there was a comment about, you know, really connecting with people who, who want to uh, give back, who, who want to be involved in the community, whether that's serving as peers or um, other uh, ways to, to get engaged. And, and, and we know that that can be hard to do at times. So I just wanted to maybe bring that question back to the forefront. I know you started to really to touch on that, but is there any more you'd like to add around, um, you know, some of those more um, spiritual or community um, aspects of older adults and um, ways we might be able to better engage them in giving back. Absolutely. I appreciate that very much. And I admit, I peeked at the question and answers, and I'm so excited about the questions I've been posed. But in terms of the spirituality, um, you know, I, I kind of self disclose like my own spirituality is a huge part of the work I do. This is a difficult charge. And, and for instance, Michael Harris's question is exactly the rub that a lot of people face. This population is often one who have potentially committed very egregious acts. And it can be very difficult to reconcile assuring dignity for the population alongside the truth that other people might have been harmed. And so like, how do you hold these sort of non-dualistic truths simultaneously? And I think that there's a meaningful opportunity for us to push ourselves as practitioners and researchers. But the spirituality, I think, is in particularly important because there's there's a wealth of insight regarding the role of spirituality and religious coping as a way to mitigate chronic illness, to reduce the perception of pain, and thus contribute to positive outcomes across the health and well-being landscape. Um, so just like we would with our adult parents or grandparents, we want to see that individuals have the opportunity to kind of make full use of the time, talent, and treasure they've been offered. Um, and we hear it all the time from the older people we work with, which is, you know, I'm I'm still meaningful. I'm still doing stuff. There's a lot of dignity in, in, in what I have to offer. So is there a way that that can be leveraged? So I'm hopeful that we can be mindful of doing that in a way that keeps people, excuse me, 
keeps people safe. Uh, that's kind of the bigger issue is balancing, just like with COVID, how do we keep people safe by not infecting them with this condition, but also combat the epidemic of loneliness? Um, and so, yeah, I want to have a perfect answer for you. It's incredibly important. I'm hopeful we can figure out a way to do it. Thank you for that. And thank you for bringing into the picture the context within, you know, we're operating with, with many of these individuals and, and um, the reality of um, some of the the safety and, and um, other concerns involved with the families that may have been impacted by the person years ago. And um, so we definitely have a lot to grapple with. And I think that's why um, the issues of older adults have gone unaddressed because they are very complex. Um, and so um, let's move on to a couple of more questions have come in. So speaking of complex, situations, complex backgrounds. Um, one person said that he's uh, working with people convicted of sexual offenses and, you know, obviously facing increasing restriction zones related to housing, work, et cetera, requirements of registration. And so um, this individual said, I've been increasingly conscious of housing issues and how they do and will affect aging seniors who are required to register and already have problems finding housing. Um, especially yeah, nursing facilities. Yeah. And so what are your thoughts about directions that need to be uh, taken or initiatives you're aware of to address those issues? I have so many thoughts, Michael, and thank you for your comment. Um, so I currently serve as the kind of pro bono reentry consultant for families against mandatory minimums. And when we were navigating compassionate release petitions, not only during COVID, but, but even now, this is by far the population with which we face the, the greatest challenges, and it is because of those residency restrictions. So my answer is someone is going to gift me with millions of dollars, and I am single-handedly going to build comprehensive skilled nursing facilities to assure death with dignity for all people, um, even, even those with sexual offenses. Um, but I think the short of the long of it would be reaching to folks who have already done this and made it work, which is those folks at 60 West. They navigated some community vitriol, which is, you know, the whole not in my backyard um, issue that's complicated with homelessness, but then also made worse by, you know, these these sort of egregious offenses. So um, I think there's a lot of leadership there and innovation, um, some risk that they took likewise. Um, but I definitely think that um, it's a it's a need. The findings here in Kentucky uh, were really based in a legislative research commission report which was, do we take a nursing home, an old one that's no longer occupied and revamp it and make it a correctional facility? Or do we take an old prison and make it a skilled nursing facility? And they were both cost prohibitive, but the direction that our state has gone has been to uh, take parts of prisons and create comprehensive nursing environments within them. The challenge, of course, is that for those who do become reentry eligible, are they gonna be able to meet their needs in the communities? And so far, there is not a mandate that allows individuals um, the security to seek long-term care supports with a felony conviction. In fact, it's a population that's not protected. You can be barred from housing based on a previous felony conviction, regardless of the offense. Um, so until there's national legislation to create a protected class of people with felony convictions, it's really going to be on a case by case basis. For us, it's cold calling admissions coordinators. And oftentimes it's painting the portrait, the health portrait of the person um, before waiting until we send over that face sheet with a DOC seal um, and kind of tempering anxieties, talking about the low risk of recidivism. Even if they do reoffend, it's an incredibly low risk of sexual reoffense. It's often technical violations. Um, and we often encourage the administrative uh, team to work closely with. Uh, the probation and parole officers to know that there is support. Like we all want to see that everyone has the necessary care level um, appropriate for their condition. Thank you for that. And I, I think that that answer covers a couple of questions about housing. Um, and there are several questions popping up around benefits, Medicaid, et cetera. So, um, you know, First, I, I just want to inform folks that, uh, you know, the states do vary. So depending on your state, your state Department of Corrections may or may not 
uh, help people register or uh, sign up for Medicaid coverage. Depending on your state, your state, your state may automatically uh, reinstate Medicaid coverage upon release. And so that's really something for you to explore within your state Department of Corrections is, and, uh, and your local jails. Are they working with the Medicaid office to get people signed up and on benefits prior to release? Are they automatically reinstating coverage upon release? Um, those are some really good questions to explore within your state and community. And um, if they aren't, then that's definitely something you want to talk about with uh, your, your local leaders. Uh, the other thing that's coming up in the chat is the 1115 waivers. And yes, um, really tremendous opportunity for the 1115 waivers to allow that 90 day in reach into jails or prisons. However, once again, that is dependent on your state and whether or not they have submitted an application to the uh, Met the federal Medicaid office uh, to get approved for those services. And um, it also depends on whether or not the application specifies that, um, that those supports will be for people in the Department of Correction or in jails. So once again, you'll wanna reach out to your local and state leaders to learn one uh, has has an application for the 11 to 15 waivers been developed and submitted. Um, if so, then then ask what what has been requested. Um, if it has not been submitted yet, then that's an opportunity to really engage with your local and state leaders to say we should really include um, 90 day uh, in reach support and coverage under Medicaid for folks coming out of our prisons and jails. And so um, it's a real opportunity, especially for our older adults who, um, as, as we know now, um, are facing so many challenges to have that Medicaid coverage could be extremely um, uh, impactful. So um, there was a question that came up that I wanted to, to pose to you, Dr. Post, uh, related to this. And I mean, I think it sounds, it might be maybe a, an obvious question, but I think that you might have some insight that, that could help us so someone said, uh, do you think older incarcerated individuals would be more receptive to care and case management when offered by a state Medicaid managed care organization? And so what are your thoughts around that? So I would have to ask them directly. My gut would tell me dealing with certain groups like the great generation, there's, there's the potential of concerns around humility and a willingness to accept help in terms of it being kind of antithetical to the values and norms of the, the subgeneration or the subpopulation, excuse me. Um, but the, the again, I, I, I'm hopeful to become a multimillionaire in the next several years. I don't know how it's going to happen, but my goal is to fix all of these problems across the continuum. But one would be increasing a workforce that has a shared correctional and gerontological expertise, because that's really what we need. Where those folks work, um, I think it can be a variety of spaces, like even having someone with an understanding of forensics in, a, in a, you know, an area agency on aging, I think would be an important contribution. So until <laughs> that utopia exists, and we have a, gerontolog a forensic gerontological workforce, um, we're really kind of leaning hard on existing structures and kind of co-educating folks um, as they navigate the process. And some of that is through our, our brokerage, which is, hey, I already know where to get durable medical equipment for five bucks. Uh, let me go ahead and make that connection with you. And while I get on the phone with this person, I'm also going to help them kind of understand the challenges that the person's been navigating. Um, it's a fine line, right? Because you don't want to necessarily share the information uh, in terms of like disclosure and, and privacy and um, issues like that. Um, but I would imagine that if we went so far as to ask the question, like if you could receive comprehensive case management services from probation and parole or, you know, the shine coordinator's office in Florida, I would think shine because, you know, folks are already bearing this sort of tripartite oppression, oppression, you know, ageism, the criminal legal system, and then ableism. Um, if you can get rid of one of those by having your primary services offered through kind of a, an older adult uh, venue, I would think that that would be helpful because the criminal legal stigma would then fade from view. Again, assuming the people who are working alongside that person understand the kind of nuances and gristle 
of that approach. Thank you for that. Um, so, you know, we've got a couple of questions around um, uh, uh, developmental um, issues, uh, competence. And so we won't get too much into competency because that could be a whole nother webinar in and of itself. Um, but I did want to just maybe touch on one question. And so someone asked, do you discuss chronological age versus physio age? But um, science has also shown that um, those cognitively uh, with prolonged or extensive incarceration, inc incarceration um, might also show being mentally ca capped at a certain developmental age. And so um, due to entering the system at an early age and, and aging in place. Uh, so in, what are your thoughts on that? And, and do you think that that has any um, bearing on how we then serve these older adults that have been aging in place in, in a kind of a system that has sheltered them from a lot of the developmental advancements um, in, in society? Um, all of that. Yes, Noel. I think to to the point though, I think it only makes the case for why such a comprehensive support is necessary and an understanding of this kind of unique, the intricacies. Um, I think we're also acknowledging in that particular situation, that's a particular subgroup, right? That's that's a of the monolith that is older adults who are incarcerated. There's those that, you know, kind of like uh, the Shawshank Redemption, right? You've got an institutionalized population who prison has been home for most of their life course. But then you do also have groups of people who have committed their first offense later in life, or perhaps, you know, they don't fall on the age crime curve and they've had multiple touch points where they're kind of in and out. Uh, that's sort of in Florida, like the persistent felony offender. So they're out for a couple of years and then they're back in, you know, depending on the, the statutory language. So I, I think regarding the developmental cap, you know, there's increasing awareness about intellectual and developmental disabilities among people who are in prison. These things, I think, just co collude or complicate the issue, which is to say you're anticipating a population being successful upon reentry. They have all of these issues. Oh, and they might also have developmental delays or not have been, you know, acculturated to society, which was sort of the same issue we talked about with the workforce mismatch, which is you might have gone to prison working in tool and die efforts. Well, then you come out most of the industries that are hiring are STEM, or it might be like, you know, fast food industries or things like that. And so there's this sort of mismatch between the individual's uh, talent and, and the need of the community. So I'm hopeful that that kind of answers your question, which is to say, being in those spaces just makes the problems worse uh, upon reentry. Now, is it justification for keeping people in that place because it's safe? We've heard that too, which is folks are now re-entry eligible, and I think a question kind of echoes this later, uh, but they have cognitive impairment issues that are pretty substantive. Is it even appropriate for the person to be released if they don't have a social network, if no long-term care setting is going to take them? What do we do? Just discharge them to the street? That's really, really serious questions to grapple through, um, and uh, a, lot, a lot of folks really chiming in, um, supporting peer support, and really, you know, what are your thoughts around peer support? So um, what are your thoughts around peer support for this age yes. group? Um, and, and what have you seen in the field or in your research? Yeah. So this is actually my direct area of scholarship is peer-based support. Um, so I can talk all day about it. Um, I'll offer a couple of things. The vast majority of scholarship in this area is really based on uh, prison hospice, which is a critical area of intervention, but not the only place that peer-based supports are important. We know about the importance of peer-based places and spaces for older adults in the community. And so we would likewise anticipate that they would have similar outcomes for those who are incarcerated. And so this can be scaffolded in some ways with those structured living environments, but then you don't have the intergenerational exposure. Again, being mindful of safety and security for our folks. Um, so I would point folks to a couple of scholars in this area. The most prominent here in the United States is Susan Loeb. Um, she's actually developed like a peer-based training uh, that is being piloted uh, to kind of empower people who are incarcerated to support other folks who are incarcerated, namely in the context of life-limiting illness, but in other ways too, spiritual support as well. Um, overseas, my colleague Warren Stewart, um, 
has been working with His Majesty's Probation and Parole Services or pr Prison Probation and Parole Services. It's kind of a mouthful um, to, to develop similarly like training materials and kind of scaffolding some formal processes around how do we recruit people and retain folks of course, keeping safety and security in mind, but also reduce the risk of burnout. That's a big issue. We talk about burnout, compassion fatigue, caregiver burden, working with older adults among people in the community. We don't really talk about that in the context of incarceration. Um, and so they have a high turnover rate, which is folks do the onboarding, they complete the necessary training, but then they only stay on for a couple of weeks because they're not interested in being beaten up by someone with cognitive impairment and an ostomy bag. Um, so that's an area for further development alongside these other kind of parallel intervention areas. Of course, we would love to see that people who have such high comprehensive nursing needs maybe aren't in these settings, but while they are, what kinds of supports and resources can be put in place? Um, so while they're aging and their health reduces, uh, that they have the supports necessary to, to be safe. And um, so it's I think kind of building on that, um, you know, one area we see peer support really playing a role is uh, in that reentry probation and parole phase um, where folks are back in the community. Um, and so there was a question about collaboration between care and probation um, and, and how probationers often um, just quoting the, the participant, um, she shared that probationers never get to speak in court uh, and then they share most of their concerns and questions with the field officer um, who may or may not have the, the skills or knowledge to, yeah. to really support uh, someone aging. Um, so what might be some thoughts or, you know, what, what have you observed around, um, you know, how can we better support probation officers that are yes. working with this population? I, I have a lot of empathy uh, for Sharice's comment. And I, I say that knowing that I had a caseload with uh, felony probation and anyone asking me to do any additional training was like, are you kidding me? I'm already drowning and you just handed me a baby. And I think that that's, um, I think we have to be really mindful of like training people to death and be like, hey, you know, the 50,000 things you already do, could you do 50,001? Um, again, that isn't necessarily that person's obligation. I think it's a lot to ask uh, for folks, again, who, Maybe they didn't go to school to become a corrections officer or probation and parole, um, but they've been working in that area. They have, you know, professional experience. Why should we also be asking them now to be experts in gerontology or geriatric, you know, uh, providers? It might not necessarily be the hat that they should be wearing. And so that's kind of one of the, the earlier points I made, but I'll expand brokerage, which is leverage the existing supports. This is a huge issue in terms of like rural areas, Kentucky Kentucky encounters this challenge a lot, but for more metro areas, lean on your area agencies on aging, look to your Alzheimer's Association, look for support groups that are already taking place in your hospitals for caregivers. Um, if folks have already piloted some of this work, see if you can bring them on. Um, no doubt they'll learn from one another too. So even if it's not a forced sort of training, you're going to kind of osmosis, you'll come into knowledge and wisdom that way. Um, from an ecological systems perspective, I think we need to be really mindful about enhancing the burden of folks who are already doing so much. So again, while I would love to, you know, create a workforce of people who have this dual skill set and, and, and expertise, um, I also don't necessarily want to impose on folks who are already doing work, quote, in their lane about, okay, now we'd also like you to learn this new content area. Um, so look to the community, st step outside of the microsystem, see what existing agencies, non-for-profits, community services, community-based organizations are working alongside the population and or caregivers of the population and see how they can be brought in as a support. I love that. And um, so kind of maybe pivoting back to peer support uh, because that is such a big um, uh, desire of our audience to, to discuss. Um, Someone did ask, you know, particularly thinking about peer support for older adults, um, what might be kind of some, an initial step or initial connection for someone to look for in their community if they want to start peer support um, for older adults? Any ideas? 
So um, just to clarify and make sure I understand, so this would be older people who have been incarcerated supporting other people coming home from incarceration over the age of 50. That's what I think I'm getting. And if that's the case, um, uh, kind of with that in mind, there are organizations that likely operate in a similar way, maybe not in the context of criminal legal system involvement, but things like senior centers already have free or low cost activities that involve peer support. Um, admittedly, we we had some comments for a low, well, not we, the University of Louisville, let me be really explicit. Myself, I had comments for a, a legislator who was introducing um, some policy and procedure around folks with felony convictions having access to senior centers. And I was like, absolutely not. That's like a third of all Kentuckians. You can't do that. Um, and no one should do that. And so uh, we don't want to bar folks who are already vulnerable from the very few resources that often exist. So it might be looking to existing older adult peer supports kind of in these other buckets um, things like hospitals often have support groups. Uh, I see Michelle just wrote, oh, I know Michelle. Michelle just wrote about hospice agencies. Um, so, you know, there's, there's already oftentimes scaffolding in place. Um, if there were enough people in the group, it's possible that it could extend to its own little click of sorts, but I would gather there are already older folks supporting one another in these spaces. We've had a lot of success I don't know if success is the right word. We don't have a lot of formal supports, especially when you move outside of the three metro areas of Kentucky, Lexington, Louisville, and Covington. Um, and what we often have to do is this sort of patchwork creative approach, really leverage informal social networks, things like churches. Uh, the same places where Alcoholics Anonymous meetings are taking place, that is an inroad. That is a place where folks can be um, a support. So that might be a, a good place to, to get started. Um, if kind of formalized structures like things that exist at ERI um, aren't in your community. So um, there are a few more questions, but we are coming to the end of our time. So we're gonna uh, move along for some of our closing slides. I know some of you are interested in getting the certificate of attendance for this webinar. Um, and so you'll see that being dropped into the chat um, very soon. But um, thank you so much, Dr. Post, for your presentation today, for all of the wonderful information, sharing your experiences and, and all of the research. Um, I know that our audience has really enjoyed um, your presentation and discussion today. So um, folks, we, we are hoping that this is just the first of other work that we'll do through the Game Center on aging populations. So stay tuned. And um, if you haven't signed up for our newsletter or, or our listserv, there'll be a chance to do that um, later on um, at the end of this event. So, um, because this is such a critical topic, we, we want folks to get more information and get connected with, like Dr. Post said, the resources that do exist in the community um, and, and kind of collaborating to um, just uh, um, expand the impact of those existing programs um, just by working together. So, um, Let's see, there should have been a poll that just popped up. And um, shortly, the Game Center will drop the link for the certificate of um, attendance in the chat. So when you see that, you can click on it and uh, your, your computer or your phone will guide you through steps you need to take to download that to your device. And you can move to the next slide, please. We do have a couple of webinars coming up in February, um, February 15th. We are going to have a discussion focused on competency um, specific for people um, with intellectual and developmental disabilities. And, um, you know, there was a, a question that came up, I think, more closely related to the topic of this webinar. So if you are interested in um, issues uh, regarding individuals with intellectual or development of disabilities and um, uh, the process they go through when competency, a question of competency is raised or um, if they are being evaluated. Um, this might be a webinar of interest for you. 
Later on in the month, we have a webinar um, more for our drug ports, our drug treatment ports that are looking to sustain themselves. Um, we have a webinar focused on planning for the future, ensuring sustainability for drug treatment ports. That's when it's gonna be on February 29th. So we hope to see you at those events. And if you look at the chat, you will see that Ashley Sabatino just dropped the webinar certificate of attendance in the chat. So be sure to click on that and your device will guide you through steps to download that certificate to your device. Next slide, please. So if you haven't signed up for the Game Center's listserv yet, here is a condensed URL or a, um, a QR code that you can use. This will take you directly to the website where you can enter your email address and join our listserv. Um, and this is where we will notify you of all upcoming webinars. We send out a monthly e-newsletter um, and we'll share other resources that come up through SAMHSA's Game Center. And that chat, uh, the link is also dropped in the chat. And then finally, if you do have other questions, if you have a question that was not addressed today and you would like to follow up on it, feel free to reach out to us at the Game Center. You'll see a toll-free number at the bottom of this slide, as well as our web page. You can, um, through either of those uh, connections, you can reach out to us and we're happy to link you with further, more information to answer any questions you may have had today that were not addressed. So the Game Center is a resource for you. And so we hope you'll take advantage of that. And so we'll just end by saying um, thank you again, Dr. Post. And, um, Thank you to all of you who joined today for this really important topic. And uh, we hope to see you again in, in February at some of our next webinars. Have a great afternoon, everyone.